thank you, Tavi. Uh, thanks for putting this all together. And thanks for everyone for coming. I'm really excited to be talking about some of the work that I'm working on for my PhD in this talk. And it's really cool to meet a lot of you and put some faces to the names. So this is going to be great. Um, so as my title alludes, I will talk about subglacial precipitates um, and how they record East Antarctic ice sheet response to ocean forcing. Um, let's see. Okay, that's how I should. Great. Um, so before I start, though, I'd like to thank um, folks that I've collaborated on with the, in this work. Um, this work is being done in Terry Blackburn's lab at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And especially this talk today has um, been done in collaboration with Slavic Tulicek um, and a bunch of other folks from different universities. I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank the folks who have provided us with samples because this work really wouldn't be possible without uh, the folks on this list. So Anne Grunau from the Polar Rock Repository has been great getting us subglacial precipitates and sending us new samples all the time. Um, Kathy Licht has sent us a sample from Antarctica and has also collaborated on this research. And then Christine Sidaway, John Stone, Bernard Halle, and John Shutt all have sent us some glacial precipitates from their field time. So that's been really great to get a bunch of new samples and meet a bunch of new people. And then obviously got to thank uh, NSF for funding the work. Okay. So I think the best place to start here is the stars of the show, the subglacial precipitates. So first off, what are subglacial precipitates? Um, these are chemical sedimentary rocks. So they're forming in aqueous environments and they're forming at the base of the ice sheet or of the Antarctic ice sheet in this case. Um, I show here a small collection of some of the precipitates that we're working on. And um, this is kind of to show you the different morphologies that these samples have. So um, for samples A through D, these are uh, made of calcite and opal, varying layers, and I'll get into that a little later. And some of the other precipitates mostly are calcite. You have these finely laminated samples and all kinds of different morphologies. And this is all a function of the subglacial environments where they form. Um, as uh, some of you might, have, might know already, I'm a geochronologist, and so I have also dated many of these samples. And um, what we know is that some of the youngest samples are around 10,000 years, and the oldest samples we've dated are up to six and a half million years old. So they're uh, archives from a long period of time at the base of the ice sheet. They also grow over periods of around 10, uh, hundreds of thousands of years in the longest cases. So as archives of basal hydrology, these samples are sort of a novel record of how things are changing at the base of the ice sheet. I also have this map up here just to give everyone a sense of where in Antarctica we have samples from. So we have samples a lot up from up along the Trans-Antarctic Mountains, um, but we also have samples from some areas on the edge of the ice sheet as well. So spatially and temporally, we have a lot to learn from these really cool samples. So another question you might have before I get into results is, um, well, if they form at the base of the ice sheet, how do you get them at the surface? So I will use elephant moraine, which is a supraglacial moraine um, in Antarctica where a lot of these have been found as an example. So I show this map here on the top left. Elephant moraine is tucked up in the Trans-Antarctic Mountains on the East Antarctic side of the Trans-Antarctics. And if you zoom in, I have a um, satellite image of elephant moraine here to the right of that. And you can see this is an area where the East Antarctic ice sheet is abutting up against the Trans-Antarctics, this topographic high. And Elephant Moraine is very close to um, David Glacier, which is an outlet glacier that funnels some of this ice into the Ross Sea. Um, in a cross-sectional view, we can see that, um, again, this, this topographic high from the Trans-Antarctics, ice is flowing from left to right. And what's happening here is that ice is being pushed to the surface, basal ice in particular, is being pushed to the surface as it flows. And in terms of where the um, precip precipitates are forming and how this all fits together, um, they are forming, as I said, in basal meltwater that are, that are uh, primarily in these low topographic regions. And as the ice flows over these aqueous systems, 
it plucks up the precipitates into the basal ice. And as that ice brings that entrained sediment to the surface, um, ice is lost via sublimation and you get these blue ice regions. You can see here, elf moraine lying in a blue ice region. And as you lose the ice, you just leave all of the sediment it was holding on the surface. You get a big pile of sediment and you find things like uh, meteorites and subglacial precipitates. And so um, for this talk, I'll be presenting subglacial precipitates as um, a way to learn about these basal meltwater environments. So it'll be good for some background just to present what we know about the modern subglacial environment first. Um, so I'll start off with this map on the left. This is from Foley and others in 2019, and they modified it from a model that Patton and others presented in 2010. And what it shows is that um, there, it shows regions of the basal ice sheet that we'd expect to have freezing in the subglacial environments versus um, melting in the subglacial environments. So what this shows is that um, for a lot of the ice sheet, both in the East Antarctic ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet, you have areas where you'd expect basal melting. Um, and as you get towards the edges where you have thinner ice, the subglacial environments are colder and you get subglacial freezing. Furthermore, there's been a lot of work done by the remote sensing community that uh, is, has taught us what the subglacial environments do, how they move, how water moves from the interior to the edge of the ice sheet. So this is a figure from Helen Fricker and others in 20, 2009. And it's just an example of some of the remote sensing work that's been done to show that you have these pockets of water, these subglacial lakes, and they flush in between each other and towards the margins um, in these flooding events. And so schematically, what this sort of all looks like is that you have these um, valley contained lakes, think of Bostock in that case, and then more towards the margins, you have this interconnected system with lakes connected by channels and they flush in, in and out of each other. And so for our purposes, these samples will be forming in more of these channelized lakes where the lakes can be filled up and flooded and flushed on uh, geologic timescales. So I would mentioned that um, the samples that we'll be looking at are these subglacial precipitates that have opal and calcite forming within one sample. And so I'll introduce the two of the samples I'll be talking about today. I'll refer to this one on the left as PRR50489 and this one on the right as MA113. And the opal layers are these white layers and the calcite layers are black in 50489 and orange in MA113. And these samples are both coming from the, the uh, East Antarctic side of the Trans-Antarctic Mountains um, around the Ross Embayment. And so the, the general question and the motivation that we started this project with is a simple one. What is causing these opal calcite transitions? because we know that it must be some cyclic change in the subglacial environment. Um, I will also spoil a little bit of the results now. Um, as I said, we're geochronologists. The first thing we do is date these things. And we've seen that, they, that these transitions happen on suborbital timescales um, every couple of thousand years based on the chronology. And so the first question I'll present you all with is, what causes the cycles and subglacial environments that are manifest as opal calcite transitions? And are they related at all to Antarctic climate or any perturbations to the ice sheet? And so the last little bit of background before the results, I'll present what we know about the global climate because this is a very climate heavy talk. Um, this is a very famous diagram from Lysikian Ramo in 2004. And it's the Benthic Delo Delta Oasis stack. And that's um, ocean core records of Delta O18 of the ocean, which is a proxy for global climate. And on the x-axis, I have time between zero and 800,000 years ago. And what we know about the climate in this part of the Pleistocene is that we have 100,000 year cycles. Oh, I put cycles twice. Sorry about that. 100,000 year cycles between 
cold periods where we have glacial maxima, more larger ice sheets, and warm periods where we have interglacials, smaller ice sheets, warmer climate. On top of these 100,000 year cycles, you have millennial cycles. So we learned first about millennial cycles from the ice core record. This is the N-grip ice, ice core record from Greenland. And it's still delta 18O on the y-axis. So again, a proxy for Greenland temperature in this case. And on the x-axis, we have time again from zero to 50,000 years ago. And what we see here is that um, through, throughout this time period, the Greenland's climate has changed between stadial cold periods. You have these decadal warming events, which are referred to as dansgaard osger events. I'll call them DO events for the rest of the talk. And then interstadial warm periods. So stadial cold, interstadial warm. And a neat aspect of this millennial cyclicity is that, um, oh, there we go, is that the, there is counter millennial cyclicity in the Southern Hemisphere. So here again is an ice core record, but in this case, it is the West Antarctic Divide ice core. And I've put some tie points here to show that during times where you have millennial scale cycling in the Northern Hemisphere, you have more gradual, but very uh, similar in time, millennial scale cyclicity of the climate in the Southern Hemisphere. Those I'll refer to as AIM events. So as I as I'd mentioned, I want to compare this, mineral, this mineralogy in these precipitates with the climate record to see what they record in the basal environment. So the first thing I want to do is find a quantitative way to represent the, these mineral cycles, these opal to calcite cyclicity. So what I do is I take an SEM image uh, across the mineral boundaries and we use EDS, which is an elemental mapping technique from these SEM images. And so here is a map. This is turned on its side of um, silica, which is the opal layers and calcium, which are the calcite layers across those layers. And we then take a line scan across these EDS images to get a, an elemental concentration, in this case, calcium on the y-axis and a spectra across sample height, which is on the x-axis and microns. And what this is, is opal layers in, uh, that are low in calcium concentration, calcium layer or calcite layers that are high in calcium concentration. So with these, we then want to use uranium series dating to place all of these this spectra in time. So um, what we do is we date with uranium thorium dates each one of them we can get a date for. So on this on these two plots for these two samples, I have again calcium weight percent on the y-axis, and now our age age model on the x-axis for both samples. Markers are layers where I have dates. In, um, in terms of PRR50489, I've dated all of the opal layers. Those are very amenable for dating. You'll notice that for MA113, we have fewer dates, and that's simply because it's harder to do. Um, it has less uranium, so it's, it's harder to get dates on there. So we get the best ages we can for this sample, and then we interpolate between the ages to place our spectra in time. And what you can see from these two plots is that the samples uh, were deposited over two very separate or very different time periods. This sample is deposited between 230,000 years ago and 150,000 years ago, whereas MA113 was deposited between 55,000 years ago and 42,000 years ago. And to a first order, the observation we made is that the opals seem to have a periodicity about them, where in PRR50489, we, they occur every around 10,000 years, and in MA113, they occur around every 2,000 years. So now we're ready to compare them to climate. And so here are the same plots for both of the samples. Um, and I now have plotted um, ice core temperature records or proxy records for temperature, um, where I use Epicodome C, the, del the uh, Delta Deuterium record for PRR50489. And because 
because MA113 is younger, we have more high resolution ice core records. So I'm comparing MA113 here to the waist divide ice core and the Taylor Dome ice core. And I threw n grip in there to give you an idea of that um, northern hemisphere signal. And as a visual aid, I, put, I highlighted the times where we have calcite precipitation for both samples. And so our first conclusion here, our first result, is that every time we have a calcite layer being deposited, that corresponds in time with a, an AIM period or a millennial scale warming event in the southern hemisphere. Conversely, when we have opal layers in white here, those are times where we have millennial scale cold periods in the southern hemisphere, and that works for both samples. So this is the first result of this project, and that is the opal calcite transitions in our precipitates correlate with mineralogic or millennial scale climate cycles where opal deposition happens during cold periods, calcite deposition happens during warm periods. So to motivate the next part of the talk, I'm just gonna ask another simple question, and that is why does the composition of subglacial waters change with climate? And to explore that, I will use, I will geochemically characterize the opal and the calcites to think about the waters that they come from or the water that they come from. So here are the first data for my geochemical characterization. These are laser ablation data and also isotopic data. So for the laser ablation, we took another spectra across the mineral layers, and I present those data in A through C here. Um, A and B are again, silica weight percent and calcium weight percent to show you where we have opal and calcite layers respectively. Calcite again, um, highlighted in yellow. Um, the first piece of laser ablation data I'll be presenting is the cerium star values. So cerium star, very briefly, is a um, proxy for the redox conditions of the water where these precipitates formed. So cerium star values of one or, or above one are periods where the water was reducing. Cerium star values below one are periods where the water that precipitated um, this precipitate was oxidizing. So again, oxi oxidizing below one, reducing above one. And as a geochemist, this is a really, really interesting and, and fascinatingly exciting correlation here where we have um, cerium star values above one, which correlate to opals, and cerium star values below one, which correlate to calcites. And that's telling us that there, these two these two different layers might be deposited by two at least chemically distinct waters. The rest of the data I will present on this slide are stable isotopic data. So instead of from a laser, these are uh, measured on individual layers. I won't go into the delta 13C too much because those are just on the calcite. You can't measure that from the opals. But what those show is that we, ha we have a pretty tight um, delta 18O values for all the calcites in the sample around minus 23. And that's a really good indication that these, sample are these samples are subglacial because if they were exposed to the atmosphere or marine environments, you would expect this uh, number to be much more enriched. It's a it would be a much higher delta 13C value. Then uh, this bottom panel is delta 18O and this is uh, back calculated to be the delta 18O of the precipitating waters from the sample. Calcite is in green and opal is in dark green. And first off, the calcites are very depleted. They're between about minus 55 and minus 51 in composition, that is per mil. And whereas the opals are uh, have a range of values between around minus 54 all the way up to minus 47 per mil. And so the take home message here is that calcite waters are oxidized and highly depleted in delta 18O, whereas opal waters are more reduced and up to eight per mil more enriched in delta 18O. So I alluded to the fact that we might be pre precipitating opal and calcite from two distinct waters. And so to um, explore that, I'm going to use this correlation diagram from the 
with those exact data I just showed on the last slide, the delta 18O values of the water in per mil and the delta 13C values of the carbon source in um, per mil as well on the x-axis. And all of these data are colored by um, cerium star with blues being the most oxidized, uh, yellows being the most reduced. Here are our calcite data. And just like I showed in the last slide, they're mostly all, they're all oxidized. Because we can't measure opal, opal carbon data, um, we just have them as bars here with the delta 18O values uh, corresponding to uh, points on the y-axis. And so there's this really interesting range of opal values. As we said, opals can be much more enriched in delta 18O. Um, and these opal values are, have a really nice correlation as well, where the most depleted values are also the most oxidized and the most enriched values are also the most reduced. So this is kind of pointing us in the direction of two distinct waters. Um, and to see if we can fit the calcite data, we're going to use a two component mixing model. So here's our two component mixing model with our best fit for all of our calcite data. The shape of that model is dependent on the positions of the end members, as well as the ratio of the amount of carbon in the two end members. So um, one end member is very depleted in both delta 18O and delta 13C. The other end member is much less depleted in both compositions. Um, and one end member must have, to fit these data, must have 97% of all the carbon in the reservoir, whereas the other end member only has three. So this is the carbon poor reservoir or water and the carbon rich water. And so now let's explore what, based on these data, based on the position of the mixing model in this plot, what might these two end members be? So um, first, this bottom end member, this is our carbon rich end member and our oxidized end member. Based on the compositions, we expect this to be close to um, a subglacial water, similar to something that would be um, in subglacial lakes whose compositions have been measured. And this other end member, uh, in order to fit these data, must be have a delta 13C close to zero. And that tells us that it's that, that delta 13C value is indicative of rocks in the substrate. Um, so that uh, a delta 13C value is kind of pointing us towards the fact that this is a, a groundwater and we know it's carbon poor. So an example of a water that fits those two criteria are some of these really highly concentrated brines that emanate in the Murdo Dry Valleys. For example, the Don Juan Pond brine, which is a, a calcium chlorine brine, very, very, very um, carbon poor and also very, very uh, uh, concentrated. There's also a geographic component to what these data can tell us. So here is a plot of the delta 18O values of the meteoric ice throughout Antarctica. And you can see that the most depleted orange values are in the domes, whereas the closer you get to the margins, you get more enriched in delta 18O. So our minus 47 end member value fits pretty well with what we would expect for waters that are close to elephant moraine where these samples were found, close to that East Antarctic edge of the Ross embayment. However, there are no, there's no ice in this area that can provide minus 55, very depleted for our calcite forming end. So we're gonna invoke waters from the domes that are actually flushing to the edge of the ice sheet to form the calcites in the sample. So just to reiterate those points, I'll take you through result two again. And that is that opals form from a reduced carbon poor concentrated brine that is proximal to elephant moraine whereas calcites form from the addition of an oxidized carbon-rich water, uh, dilute glacial meltwater that is, from the ice sheet interior into the system mixing with that brine. So the next question to motivate this next part of the talk will be, what is the actual physical process that brings about 
discrete opal and calcite layers. So taking all of the geochronology I just presented and the geochemistry I just presented as criteria, starting criteria, I use uh, FreeQC modeling, which is geochemical modeling software, to first try to find the formation mechanism of the opal layers. So um, what we know to get about uh, surface waters as a starting criteria is that most surface waters on the surface of the earth, including those brines I mentioned, should have silicon values, silicon concentrations of around 14 per mil. If that is a maximum that they can have, because if they have any more, they will precipitate out opal, but not enough to actually make the uh, millimeter scale layers that we see in our samples. So we need some concentration mechanism to take our brine and get opal to precipitate out in any large, in any large scale, like a millimeter scale. So we're going to invoke cryogenic concentration as this concentration mechanism. Some of the work from Bernard Halle that he's well known for, as well as some of the work that Terry Blackburn, my advisor, has worked on, shows that, that cryogenic concentration in alpine glaciers is a good way to get opal saturation, opal precipitation. We also know from some of the work uh, from Robin Bell and others that freezing at the base of the Antarctic ice sheet is something that readily happens. So this seems like a um, reasonable scenario to invoke. Um, I should also add that uh, what helps us is that these brines have, are very low in carbon, which is a criteria from our geochemistry. And it means that when we concentrate these waters, we will not get calcite precipitation. So that'll, that'll result in, um, that'll help us result in discrete opal precipitation, opal layers without any calcite precipitation. So on to the model. Here I'm modeling subglacial freezing in different freezing where from right to left, I get more frozen. So on the right, that is the fraction of water that's still remaining. So uh, this 0.6 means that we've frozen 40% of the water in the subglacial reservoir, all the way to 80% of the water in the subglacial reservoir. And what I'm plotting is the saturation index of ice on this y-axis and in blue, and opal on this y-axis and in red. And as you can see, in order to cross the opal precipitation threshold, you need to freeze around 70% of the ice in your subglacial reservoir uh, with the starting conditions. However, this is, this is a positive result for us because it shows that cryogenic concentration can indeed precipitate out opal with a brine precursor. So that's step one. Now, um, as I mentioned, the geochemistry points to, the, to calcite formation upon mixing of meltwater that's flushed from the interior. So the next free QC model I will be uh, presenting is simulating exactly that. So on the x-axis, I have percent meltwater in the mixture going from 10% meltwater, 90% brine, and marching to more meltwater that's flushing into the system to the right, so I have 90% meltwater and 10% brine on the right side. So the first, um, the first take home message from this is that as soon as you dilute that brine, you shut off your opal precipitation, which is uh, here in red. So you, your saturation index no longer is at the opal precipitation threshold, so that's check. We can stop our opal precipitation, and then we know we need discrete pulses of calcite precipitation. And indeed, with between around 25% and 85% meltwater that's flushed into this mixture, we get supersaturation of calcite that, and we get calcite precipitation. So this is the third result I will present in this talk, and that is that freak models indicate distinct periods of freezing and flushing are a plausible scenario to cause opal and calcite precipitation. And for the last part of the talk, I'll present one more question. I really like these questions. One more simple question, and that is, what's the glacial process that's behind all of this? What glacial process results in freeze and flush cycles that correspond, again, to millennial scale climate changes? And so to explore this, um, our colleague Slavik Tulicek uh, made this model, this reduced complexity model of ice sheet thermodynamics. I'll take this time to just admit that this is not my area of expertise. 
I think Slavic's in the audience though. So if anybody has any more detailed questions for us after the talk, I think he can help. I'll give just a, a broad overview now. And so again, we're trying, Slavic here trying to model what thermodynamic conditions from the ice sheet can actually result in freezing and flushing on millennial timescales. And to do that, we start with the basal thermal energy balance between the ice and the bedrock or at the ice bedrock inter interface. That's this E term. And I'll just bring you along the terms for this, for this equation. And I like to think of these as the, the things, the, the variables that can bring heat to the ice rock interface. That's this G and S term. And the heat sinks, that's this Q term. And I'll get into what those mean now. So the G term is our geothermal heat flux coming from O. The S term is any shear heating that might enhance uh, heat at the ice rock interface when the, this ice is moving. And this last term, this Q term, is conductive heat loss, any loss to the above. And so the first question we might ask ourselves is, which one of these heat terms or which ones of these heat terms can change on millennial timescales. So I can start off with this uh, geothermal heat flux. We don't have any reason to think that the geothermal heat flux changes in this area and on millennial timescales, so we're going to treat that as constant. The shear heating term is interesting to us. That can indeed change on millennial timescales, so we'll think about that in a second. And what about this conductive heat loss, this Q term? Well, this Q, this conductive heat loss in this area is very much controlled by the thickness of the ice sheet. So uh, for context, these precipitates based on where they're forming are likely under, under forming underneath around 1500 meters of ice. So first of all, any change to the, the surface temperature would be severely muted by that thick ice sheet above. Um, another thing that can change the conductive heat loss term on millennial cycles is the accumulation rate uh, of the ice above because we know that the accumulation rate does change on these time scales. However, to get that, that uh, change in heat from the accumulation rate change all the, to propagate down to the ice bedrock interface would lag these millennial cycles by around 10,000 years. So all in all, we don't think that this Q term is really going to get us to our millennial scale phase changes. So uh, we are left with this, this S term, our shear heating term. And I'm going to break this down a little bit more for everyone in the next slides. So shear heating is equal to this tau term, which are, is our gravitational driving stress, times the deformational ice velocity in the system. To break this down a little bit further, um, I'll just go through really briefly all of these terms that go into shear heating. Um, shear heating will change as a function of the ice viscosity parameter, this N, which is the stress exponent in the ice flow law, our rho, which is our ice density, G, which is our gravitational acceleration, A, which is the ice surface slope, and H, which is ice thickness. And I highlight A and H because these are variables that we think are glaciologically relevant and can reasonably be changing uh, on millennial timescales. So let's dive into those two variables now. And so as a visual aid, I'll use map. This is a uh, bedrock elevation map for the area around the Ross ice, around the Ross embayment where our sample's coming from. PRR50489 comes from this uh, area that I highlight with this dot. And what I want you to take from this very low resolution map is that this is an area where ice is flowing through these tributaries, these um, outlet glaciers that are funneling ice from the East Antarctic ice sheet into the Ross embayment. And although they're, they don't jump out at you from this uh, simple elevation map, even close to our sample area, there are these smaller um, little outlet glaciers that are funneling ice through the Transantarctics. So let's talk about this um, A term, this surface slope term, and we're going to be modeling it, its change with time and also along the ice pathway. So by ice pathway, I mean, I mean the pathway between the sample area 
and the discharge area, which is the mouth of the Ross Sea, mouth to the Ross Sea. So the surface slope is changing as a function of this delta B term, which is the difference in the bedrock elevation, both at the sampling area and at the region of ice discharge. That's not going to change on millennial scale time scales. We can kind of just take it for a constant. Um, and then we have these two H terms, which are ice thickness, HT being ice thickness at the sample region, HRE being ice, ice thickness at the mouth of the transantarctics, and then just the distance between those two areas. And so in terms of uh, things that can change on millennial scale timescales, it's the ice thickness and obviously the surface slope, which is a function of the ice thickness. I will briefly add now that this HRE term, which is the ice thickness at the drainage area, is changed, is we are modeling this as a change that is a linear function of the climate as it marches through time. So here I show um, the Epigodome C delta deuterium record, and I have the same magnitude and uh, frequency ice thickness changes. So again, we are modeling this at this these ice thickness changes at the mouth of or at the region of discharge as a linear function of the changes in climate, which I show here uh, from the ice core proxies. And these ice thickness changes that we're calling on to get uh, millennial scale phase changes would need to be on the order of about, of about 500 meters. So just to, to reiterate some of that, we have our three terms, our surface slope along the ice pathway, and our two ice thickness slopes. And when we solve this thermodynamic, this system of equations, rather, we have, we have this result that shows us that ice thinning, or the, that term that can actually change on millennial timescales, and changes in the ice slope that, that uh, correlate to those ice thinning events, can drive millennial scale changes in shear heating. And so I'll show those. Um, the uh, I'll show the results of those model calculations now. So remember, we're looking, we're starting off with our equation and we're thinking about how we can change shear heating to get these millennial scale cycles in subglacial hydrology. So here's our familiar graphs. We have our, um, our mineral, mineralogy through time on the bottom for both samples. We have our ice core climate proxies. Uh, on the top, and our modeled basal heat budget is in the middle. And so the idea here is that we're solving for these and we're seeing if the modeled basal heat budget comes up with freezing during cold periods and uh, melting during warm periods. And I'd say Slavic did a really nice job. I'm very, I'm very impressed, Slavic, because uh, what we see is a modeled basal heat budget that is negative or it's cold, it's freezing, um, during times where we get opal precipitation, we have a nice correlation. And then we have a model basal heat budget that is warm enough to melt the ice during times where we would expect calcite precipitation. So this is going to be my final result I present here. And that's going to be that the model basal heat budget shows that shear heating is indeed a way to get millennial scale warm periods, driving basal flushing. And the way we're doing that is we're invoking ice thinning. So just to give a schematic of that last argument I made um, of the fact that millennial scale cycles and shear heating drive hydrologic cycles at the base of the ice sheet, um, I just want to uh, re-go back to that, or just go back to that, um, that model from Foley and others. And I want to point out that our two samples come from very close to the boundary between freezing and flushing that we would expect in the subglacial environment. And so What's happening, we think is happening, is that when you have cold periods, your ice sheet is thicker and your freeze melt front is you know, further inboard than our, where our samples are forming, somewhere around here probably. And as you thin the ice sheet during a warm period, that freeze melt front migrates. It migrates towards the edge of the ice sheet. And we see that by flushing in those oxidized melt waters those glacial meltwaters to our system and driving calcite precipitation. Um, so it's, it is a connectivity is what I wanted to say. So that is, 
it, you are, um, during millennial scale warm periods, you are enhancing subglacial hydrologic connectivity. And so what about, but what about these thinning events? For this last part of my talk, I just wanna, I wanna explore a little bit of the why and the how. So first off, are these the subglacial, or excuse me, Antarctic thinning events on millennial cycles are not unprecedented in terms of uh, the geologic record. Um, here are some figures from a paper by Weber and others in 2014 who have showed um, from ice core, who have ice core records from the last termination. And these records are from the Waddell Sea, which is Iceberg Alley, because this is where icebergs will funnel from the, uh, the Southern Ocean currents, will funnel these icebergs out into the Waddell Sea. And so periods where you see high iceberg rafted debris in, dr in sedimentary drill cores correspond to times where you have more ice icebergs uh, and more icebergs corresponds, you know, reasonably to more ice loss. And so what Weber shows is that you have these enhanced iceberg rafted debris events that correspond to Southern Hemisphere AIM events. And so very similar to what we're showing. And where we're taking this further is that now we're showing that you actually have thinning events that correspond to times outside of the termination, so very different climatologically. And also these are, we, ours are terrestrial records that give us sort of a area and space where we expect to have these thinning events and um, our area is on the East Antarctic side. So finally, I will get to the, the how, oh, I went too far. I'll get to the how in the last couple of minutes of my talk. And to understand this, we'll have to go back to our millennial scale cyclicity. And uh, I'm going to be invoking Ant Atlantic meridional overturning circulation or ocean circulation rather, which is driving the millennial scale cyclicity of both in both of these ice cores. So the millennial scale changes in, um, in climate is being driven by changes in ocean circulation. So really briefly, how this ocean circulation is working is that when AMOC is, when the circulation is going, you're pulling warm waters, warm surface waters out of the Southern Ocean, which is acting to pull heat out of the Southern Hemisphere, which cools the Southern Hemisphere and warms the Northern Hemisphere. During times where you get uh, stadials, cold periods in the Northern Hemisphere, you shut down the circulation. So this, this uh, millennial cyclicity is an ocean cyclicity, the shutting off and the turning on of this AMOC. And there are some very important teleconnections between this ocean circulation and the atmosphere. So during times where you have AMOC uh, circulating very rapidly, it acts to dampen the gradient between the temperature of the two hemispheres. But when you don't have your ocean circulation modulating the temperature of the two hemispheres, you get a steeper gradient in heat between the northern and southern hemispheres. That acts to drive the southern hemisphere westerly winds further towards the Antarctic continent, and it strengthens them. So during periods of where you would expect millennial scale warm periods in the southern hemisphere, you also get enhanced southern westerly winds that are uh, closer in space to the Antarctic ice sheet. And there's an, an important feedback of stronger and uh, lower latitude winds, and that is for uh, Southern Ocean overturning. So here is a stack from Anderson and others in 2009, and they have their ice core climate proxies for the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere, where you have those millennial scale warm periods in the Southern Hemisphere, uh, corresponding to millennial scale cold periods in the Northern Hemisphere. And then th this bottom, these bottom two panels are the important part. These are um, proxies for Southern Ocean upwelling. And so what you can see is a really nice correlation between times where you have these AIM events, these Southern Hemisphere warm events, and these upwelling events, which are um, in periods of enhanced Southern Ocean upwelling. And when the Southern Ocean cools on these millennial scales, you get less upwelling. And this is gonna have a really important uh, control on the Antarctic ice sheet. So um, first I wanna just take, a, take the time to 
uh, show that the Southern Hemisphere, or touch upon the fact that the Southern Ocean is somewhat uh, stratified where the, the uh, surface waters are colder and the warmest waters are the circumpolar deep waters. So these deep Southern Ocean waters. So you, you can imagine that during times where you have enhanced upwelling, these millennial scale warm periods, you're taking these warm, deep Southern Ocean waters and you're allowing them to go up onto the shelf and to interact with the ice shelves. And what this does is that this starts to melt the ice shelves from the base. You, when you melt the ice shelves, you reduce the buttressing back stress that's holding the ice sheet back. And so you get enhanced uh, motion. You have acceleration of the ice sheet towards the margins. Um, and as I mentioned, this is not an unprecedented idea. A lot of folks have done a nice job modeling this. This is a model from uh, Gollage and others in 2014. And they're showing exactly that. They're showing the uh, response of the Antarctic ice sheet in terms of surf ice surface velocity to enhanced ocean forcing. So as I mentioned, this is a time where you get warm waters melting at the ice shelves. And what you see is you get enhanced ice velocity, mainly in these, uh, in these embayments, in these major Antarctic embayments. And so what I'm going to, what I'm invoking to, uh, I'm going to invoke this process to explain why we get thinning, millennial scale thinning, driving that hydrologic response. And it, it is an ocean forcing story. And so in lieu of conclusions, I'm just going to summarize those exact ideas one more time. So um, Atl the Atlantic meridional overturning is driving our um, millennial scale cycles, both in northern and southern hemisphere climate. And that's driving southern ocean upwelling that corresponds to this, this exact millennial cyclicity. So you have periods of more southern ocean upwelling during millennial scale warm periods less Southern Ocean upwelling during, during millennial scale cold periods. Uh, and we are where um, we hypothesize that during times of less ocean forcing, less upwelling of those warm waters, we have a more stagnant ice sheet and we don't have as much um, ice thinning or uh, acceleration, especially in these embayments. And that corresponds to times where our uh, subglacial reservoir would be freezing and then as you enhance, as you start to thin the ice shells, you enhance ice velocity, you thin out the ice sheet, uh, especially in the Ross embayment where our samples come from. And that, uh, that drives enhanced connectivity of the basal hydrologic system. And that finally results in our samples, our beautiful subglacial opal calcite precipitate samples and explains why they correspond to millennial cyclicity in climate. Uh, so with that, I will end my talk. I'll thank everyone for watching. Um, take questions if anyone has any and we have any time. And uh, finally, I'll just plug next week's talk, which looks to be a good one. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. So thanks again, everyone, for watching. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the way that we uh, do questions is normally to ask people to indicate on the chat if they've got a question and then we are, get you to switch on your microphone and ask your question um, directly to Gavin. Um, so do we have any uh, anybody with a question? And I will just also check on Facebook. Um, uh, Gavin, uh, this is Bernard. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, Bernard. Oh, great. Well, wonderful talk. I must say it's impressive how much material you've been able to present and to make it coherent. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a wonderful, you know, story that goes far beyond anything that I've thought about. And, uh, but I, I do have a question about, um, I think this is fantastic. I mean, I, mean, I, can, I can imagine that you're doing this for a long time. But uh, my <laughs> first question is that, when I look at that variation between, you know, the layers that are opal and then the carbonates, uh, you know, I wonder more, more locally, I mean, you know, we're, we've got this dynamic subglacial hydrology. Uh, how do we know we're just not, you know, making a connection with a nearby reservoir and just freezing up a big, big body of water and causing a bunch of travertine to form? Uh, so I guess one question is, do you, do you have 
if you looked at other samples and do they give you the same kind of periodicity and also is the phasing correct as well? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Thanks, Bernard, and uh, thanks for the kind words. Um, th that's a yeah, really good question, and I'm going to go back to our um, our geochemistry to help me answer that. Um, so, first of all, how do we know? You asked, how do we know that these aren't just local effects? And I will admit, we don't really have a good constraint on the source of these these precipitates. Besides the fact that based on modern um, ice velocities, there is really no way to invoke these precipitates coming from very far away. So in order for them to get to the spot where they've been sampled, they must have been precipitating locally. Uh, so that's one thing. And then in terms of the sort of ice sheet wide story and the fact that we think that this is um, an ice sheet wide story, we really, we really, uh, look towards these delta 18O values, the delta 18O values of the waters. So, um, and really the, the answer to your question is that, uh, is that to get these very depleted waters, we at least need interconnectivity into the interior of the ice sheet. Now this is not actually a really uh, wild idea. There have been a lot of, again, remote sensing folks who have shown interconnected lakes, well, not necessarily interconnected, but uh, basically a line of lakes between Dome C and the edge of the ice sheet. So we know that there's an active hydrology underneath that. And then in terms of uh, why we think that this couldn't be just a, a very local change in ice velocity, well, the way I think about it is that this source, this signal must be coming from the ocean side of things, right? You, uh, Slavic very nicely showed here, I'm going to go to my ice model again, very nicely showed that you need to enhance the shear heating term to get um, subglacial freezing and flushing on these time scales. And in order to actually get a millennial scale change, you need very large changes in the height to drive that shear heating. So this is all kind of pointing to the fact that it'd be very hard to do this locally and you'd have to invoke a, a very much a local change in the, um, in the height of the ice sheet. Does that answer your question? Uh, thank you, you, you did. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't asking if you had sampled from all over, you know, the, the, all over Antarctica. I was just wondering if you look at another sample from elephant moraine, does it tell you the same thing? Yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, I forgot about that part of your question. So um, we are, we are at the mercy of the rocks that we have. So um, we do not have many more samples that show us this cyclicity. I actually showed in the first slide, um, these four samples are the only samples that have this opal calcite cyclicity. So it's hard to say whether that's just a sampling bias. We've actually never gone to this place to look for them. So we don't know if they're really just hanging around everywhere and no one's ever really picked them up. Uh, these samples were in the Polar Rock Repository, so I think they were all, uh, besides D, which Kathy Litt shared with us. Um, and so we, we definitely know that we have opal calcite precipitation happening both in the log glacier up here where my cursor is and in elephant moraine. So spatially, at least this process is happening over a thousand kilometers in time. Um, but we don't have very many other samples that have this cyclicity. So it's hard to say. We do have precipitates from elephant moraine, but these are the only ones that have the opal calcite cyclicity. So um, beyond that, it's really hard to say. Thank you. We have a couple of questions from Facebook. Um, so one question is from Anna Ruth Harvestart, um, and she's asking um, how you place your results in context with modern models of basal hydrological routing. Yeah, this is a really good question. And I'll be honest, this is sort of kind of how we've seen as the next step of this work. We have a lot of samples that um, show different things about the subglacial hydrology. And by different, I mean like shorter time scale cycling and things like that. Um, so I haven't really thought of too much in terms of modern models. All I really can speak on is uh, based on the remote sensing work I've read about. And 
um, I think this fits well in terms of an interconnected hydrologic system and a hydrologic system that's constantly uh, flushing from up gradient. Um, so sorry, I couldn't answer with a more concise answer, but that's kind of where we are at in terms of our thinking. But it'd be really cool um, if anybody has any further comments, if we talked about it afterwards or just shoot me an email. And there's one from Adam Kashtan on Facebook as well. Um, he says, thanks, Gavin. Very interesting and great talk. Question, the ice thickness change between minus 200 meters and minus 600 meters, how I understand no more, no less in millennium cycle. I'm, I don't know whether that makes quite makes sense to you, Gavin. I think, uh, oh, I see that you put the question in the chat. Let me just read yeah. it. More. The ice thickness change between minus 200 and minus, how I understand no more, no less in millennium cycles. Uh, so I, I'm reading this as a clarification of the changes in ice thickness that we need to invoke for uh, this to work on millennial cycles. And um, as I understand it, that's the way he's putting it is correct, where we would, we would need ice thickness changes, you know, on the order of 400 meters, like he puts in the, the chat, to get the, the changes in the, um, in the basal energy budget to, to match in time with the millennial cyclicity uh, that we know is happening on millennial timescales based on the geochronology. So that's right. Thank you. And Michael Kaplan, do you want to unmute yourself and ask a question? Hi, uh, great talk. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, Thank you. I'm trying to get my head around um, how much time it would take for something to happen at the surface to make its way down to the bed and and then you get your precipitate forming and then you know, trying to match it up with millennial scale aim events. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert on the time it would take, but to go from the surface to what happens at the bed for your sample precipitate to form. So I was just curious if, if that's in sync with a millennial, you know, uh, correlating it to like millennial timescale events. And, it, and it's related to another question, sorry. <laughs> Go on the, you know, I get the sense that in some of the internal places, uh, I work at Lower Glacier with Kathy, that the maximum surface elevations are not exactly in sync with the coldest periods or the warmest periods, you know, so those questions are kind of related. Yeah, you know, no. but My question is if you could, you know, just the first thing from a glaciologic point of view, the time lag and and it's, it's sort of related to Bernard's question as well, I think, you know. Yeah. yeah. No, these are good questions and, and ones that we've thought a little bit about. Uh, a lot of uh, folks have made this comment on our work a lot that uh, there is, you would expect there to be some lag in both ice thickness response to ocean forcing and that response to be uh, sort of, um, to get, make its way, in other words, down to the base of the ice sheet. And so first of all, I just want to talk about the uncertainties in our dating first. And that is, we basically have around 500 year uncertainties in either direction for our dates. Um, that, this actually is, is very close to also the dating uncertainties of the ice core record as well. So in terms of a lag, excuse me, in terms of a lag that you would expect glaciologically on those timescales, we would have no way of actually making that out. And it would also not really, um, not really sort of make its way into our final data set. Um, now, the timescale of the thinning that is sort of built into Slavic's model, um, and what I didn't talk about and um, will try and touch on now, let me just pull that up, is that, um, let's see, no, not this one. So you would expect ice thickness changes to have to be um, changing at least close to in sync with the millennial scale cyclicity in the Ross Sea. And 
by, by like thinking about it in this way, you sort of get to the amount of coupling you would need from ocean heating to the ice sheet to get those thickness changes. That seems to me to be still the, um, the part of the question that that's, needs to be answered, right? Um, and so the best we can say is that um, we basically um, can force our, mod our thermodynamic model to match the, uh, to match our geochemical data and our geochronology data, but you would need ice thickness changes on the order of hundreds of meters in the raw sea to correspond in time to millennial scales. And so the way to do that would be to, for them to be very highly coupled to the ocean forcing mechanism. So that was sort of a circuitous way of answering your question. I think that uh, it's still something that um, is, you know, it's a part of our work and that we need to be answering, but just based on Slavic's model, which actually has the time built into it, the real, th the real limiting factor is the coupling between the O forcing and the ice sheet changes that can drive ice thickness changes on this time scale. I will also add before I'm done answering this question though that um, the, the same idea is a question for um, the Weber et al paper where, where in other places where you see this millennial ice sheet, uh, this millennial ice sheet response, you have to invoke like very fast time scales of ice calving. So it's not entirely um, unprecedented, but it is, yeah, something that we need to invoke. Sorry for the long answer. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to take up so much of the question period. <laughs> Any last questions? Um, Roger. Thank, thanks very much, and thanks very much, Gavin. Um, I just wondered, it, given the, the paucity of the samples that you've been able to get, whether there's any anywhere else worth uh, looking. Um, there, there are some shallow cores taken offshore. Um, maybe there are areas that are exposed by retreat. Um, just to, mm -hmm. how unusual are these phenomena? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's kind of hard for me to answer because we've never had a field campaign going to look for these in terms of how, you know, how rare are they on the actual ice sheet itself. Um, I think that just judging by the very, you know, we have 50 precipitates from elephant moraine and five of them have these samples, have these cyclicity or the cyclicity one from log glacier. So um, it's, I'd imagine that there's more out there in terms of the rock record on the continent, and that'll be, you know, up to folks to go looking for them. And then in terms of, you know, boreholes, this is a really good question. It's something I've been really keen to try and do later on in my career maybe, but um, see if there is any evidence of similar processes, at least in any drill cores. You can imagine that, um, if there's thinning, there would be other evidence in, you know, boreholes as well. So um, remains to be seen, though. I can't really speak to that first part of the question. Yeah, but a good I, I, I was just tipping you off for a title for your first postdoc, really. So, <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. That is good a really luck with good the PhD thing. defense. Enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. No. Good. Good. Uh, good little tip off there. I'll keep that in my back pocket. So I think we've run out of questions there, unless anyone can type really, really quickly. So um, I guess it's just, uh, could you pop the last slide on again, Gavin? Is oh, that yes. possible? Yeah. Just to uh, re remind everyone about next week's uh, seminar. I see uh, Saya on, on the call there, um, and it's him and uh, his daughter, Maria. So. This looks a really intriguing and um, interesting talk, and I'm really looking forward to, to see to see what we can learn from that. So I, I love these talks that have um, artwork um, intriguing us um, and drawing us in. So looking very much forward to that. And thank you very much indeed, Gavin, for um, the talk today. And thank you for everyone for attending. So uh, hope to see you all next week. Thank you, Tavi, for organizing. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming as well. Appreciate it.